Welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are tuning in from uh, the world. Uh, so I'm Tyler Shores. I manage the Think Cloud program here at the University of Cambridge and super excited that we're joined by Dr. Gloria Mark, author of uh, her latest book, Attention Span, Finding Focus for a Fulfilling Life. Uh, very interesting book, as she'll get into. Brief bio, and then I'll be quiet so that Gloria can take over. Gloria Mark is Chancellor's Professor of Informatics at the University of California, Irvine. Um, if everyone could mute uh, as you join, make sure we don't have any background mm -hmm. noise. That would be very appreciated. Um, Gloria is... I would, it's safe to say a, uh, a world leading researcher and expert in the fields of attention, multitasking and human computer interactions. She's a two time recipient of the Google Research Award and uh, her primary research interest covers uh, the impact of digital media on our lives and in our work, especially multitasking mood and behavior in digital environments. Uh, her work is everywhere, uh, including the New York Times, uh, Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, Fast Company, Forbes, Time, BBC, NPR, and many others. But super happy that you're able to join us today, Gloria. So um, thank you for your time, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Tyler, and thank you for this generous introduction. Okay, so uh, I'm so happy to be able to be giving everyone this talk. I, I wish I could be there in person. That's my my only regret, but maybe next time. Hopefully. So uh, a lot of people ask, how, how did you get the idea to study attention with our devices? Where, where did that come from? And it actually started here. This is Schloss Birlinghofen. This is, it's a castle in Germany, but it's actually uh, the home of the German National Research Center for Information Technology, uh, which, uh, which now uh, became Fraunhofer. But at the time, uh, I was starting to study human-computer interaction. But uh, what actually got me thinking about our lives in the digital age was my lunchtime experience. So in Germany, the main meal of the day is called Mittagessen. That's, that's a you know big warm meal. And the colleagues would go, we'd have this nice lunch, and then we would take a 20 minute walk around campus. And my life as a researcher was, I would call it a life of luxury in that I only had one project to work on, may, maybe a second one, uh, but I could really focus on that. And then in 2000, I moved back to the US, became an assistant professor at University of California, Irvine. And my life changed in so many ways, right? The culture changed, the job changed, uh, and our digital world was really starting to take off in, in 2000. So the web was starting to uh, reach a, a height of popularity. Now, my lunchtime practice was very different. Uh, between classes, I would run, grab lunch, race back to my office, uh, and then I would see all the open doors of my colleagues and everyone sitting behind their computer screen eating. And I would slide in, into my chair and I would do exactly the same thing. And lunch for me represented simply time away from the screen so I could grab sustenance and get right back to work. I also noticed something very different happening now that I'm back in the US. I, I Not only was I tethered to my computer, but I couldn't keep my, my focus on any screen for a long time. And I noticed I kept switching between different tasks. I had more than one project to do. I had committees to sit on, students, et cetera. And, my attention was just flipping back and forth madly. And being a scientist, I wondered, am I the only one? How widespread is this? So I set off to study this. So we, we live in a world, digital world, that's that's really say, has a lot of chaos. <laughs> uh, can, can I ask you to please can mute? What time your mom come in? Thank you. Uh, so the, the digital world is just uh, chaos in a lot of ways. 
of course it's brought us benefits, but you know, we have emails we feel we can't keep up with. There's Slack, social media, there's news, uh, the, the lure of the web. I mean, there's, there's so much going on in the digital world. And so I want to try to unpack what this does for our attention. So here's, here's the basic premise here. Technology, the design of technology was designed to extend our human capabilities so that we can do more. But ultimately, the human mind acts as a bottleneck. So we have these capabilities, you know, we can be superhuman, but it's our own human uh, minds that actually uh, prevent us, that have constraints for us being able to do what technology offers. Oops. So if you don't already know William James, let the idea of uh, the definition of attention actually starts here. So William James is known as the father of psychology. And he defines attention this way. He says, everyone knows what attention is. It's the taking possession by the mind in clear and vivid form of one out of what seems several simultaneously possible objects or trains of thought, focalization, concentration of consciousness are of its essence. Uh, of course, everyone knows what attention is, but William James didn't get it fully correct because it turns out that yes, attention, we can have attention in our consciousness. It can be very controlled. That's just one aspect of attention. It's called controlled processing. So when you try to, when you're reading a book, when, you, when you're writing, right? When you're in a conversation with someone, you're using controlled attention, right? It's effortful. It involves some amount of effort. But there's another kind of attention which involves automatic processing. And it, it doesn't involve any effort whatsoever. And it's not really in your consciousness. An example is when you're driving. How many of you had the experience where you're driving for, say, 15 minutes, and then suddenly you realize, well, where, what was I just doing, right? That's why we can drive and talk to someone at the same time, because driving can be automatic. However, as soon as a car swerves in front of you, it stops being automatic and suddenly you give it controlled attention. And it's the same when we use our digital devices. It's a mixture of using controlled processing and automatic processing. When we use any kind of productivity software like Word or Excel or people who code, it involves mental effort, even email. Uh, and then you're you're using controlled processing. But there's a lot of actions that we do with our devices that are automatic, such as you see your phone and you reach for it without thinking. Or you suddenly check your email without thinking or check social media. Uh, or you just click on a notification. All of those are automatic kinds of processes. So there is this, this uh, combination of these two kinds of attention that we use. And I'm gonna talk about other kinds of attention a little bit later. I'm gonna break down controlled processing a little bit more finer grained in a bit. So why do we get exhausted when we're on our devices? And I've heard this over and over again, I've experienced myself, and it ties to a longstanding theory in psychology that goes back over 50 years and it's this idea, it's a theory that the mind has a limited pool of attentional resources. And these resources can be drained or we can replenish them. And we get exhausted because the demands on our resources exceed the amount of resources we have available. So when you feel like maybe it's late afternoon and you've been you know, working hard all day, trying to keep up with email, switching your tasks, you feel like you're running on empty. 
Well, the, the theory behind it says, yeah, you really are running close to empty because your mental resources have drained. So when people are switching attention very rapidly between different tasks, uh, we think we're doing more, but we're actually doing less. And some people think that it's possible to do two tasks at the same time. It's not humanly possible to parallel process unless one or both of those tasks happen to be automatic. You can walk and chew gum. Both of those are automatic kinds of uh, activities. We don't put in a lot of mental effort, uh, but if you're walking and all of a sudden a bicyclist clips you in front of you, all of a sudden you give your attention to that bicyclist and that's no longer an automatic activity. But why do we do less when we multitask? Well, there's three reasons. First of all, people make more errors when they're switching their attention. We know this from decades of laboratory studies. We also know this from real world studies. So uh, studies of physicians, nurses, pilots show that they make more errors when they're multitasking, shifting their attention. In fact, uh, something that's really disconcerting is that physicians make more prescribing errors. Uh, we also know that there's that it takes more time to perform activities uh, when people switch their attention. The, the single activity, when it's broken up because you're leaving it, coming back to it, actually takes more time than if you were to work straight through on that single task, monotask. Uh, why? Uh, there's something called a switch cost, and let me explain what's going on in the mind. So you can think of for every task we do, we have an internal representation of that task. So if I'm writing a paper, I have a representation of, you know, what is the content that I want to use? What do I want to write about? What's the research that's going into it? I have a representation of that in my mind. And when I switch to look at email, suddenly I have to come up with a new representation of that email. Who's the sender? What information do they want of me? Uh, and then I switch to something else. And you can think of a, a good analogy that I like to use is that of a whiteboard, an internal whiteboard of the mind. And you're erasing the representation of one task, and then you're writing on the new representation of this new task every time you switch. And just like with a real whiteboard, sometimes you can leave a residue, right? Because you don't can't erase it completely. That can also happen with us when we switch tasks. I read a news article about some gripping story about an accident, and that stays with me. And that and that interferes with my current task at hand. And of course, uh, probably the worst thing of all is that multitasking is associated with higher stress. Uh, we it, we know in laboratory research, it raises blood pressure. Uh, it's associated with a, a physiological marker that indicates stress. In my research, we've had people wear heart rate monitors that can measure stress. And we see a very strong correlation between switching attention and stress. And, and people report higher perceived stress. So all of these measures are consistent. So not, not a ideal thing to multitask. It also turns out you can actually see the visible effects of uh, on people's faces when they multitask. This is a laboratory experiment we did where uh, subjects were asked to do a task. Uh, first, they were, they were given two tasks, one after another. And in an, another condition, they were asked to do the same task, but they were interrupted. So the, the first task, they actually had uh, an essay to write, and then they were given a set of emails to work on. In the second condition, they wrote the essay, but were continually interrupted by these emails. The image on the left, we, we videotaped people's faces. We applied a, an emotion 
uh, detection software, which is pretty accurate at um, uh, explaining or, or describing emotions based on you know different uh, muscle changes in the mind. It's very precise. The person on the left was in the condition without multitasking. And this is an example of an image showing she had a neutral expression. The two images on the right are the person who's in the multitasking condition. And you see that her face visibly shows that she's she's angry. Uh, and, um, you know, organizations are public spaces and emotion can have contagion. So if you're in an, in an organization where people are exhausted and multitasking, uh, you might actually see it on their faces. So uh, when I set out to start studying this, um, I wanted to actually go to where people are to study their tech use. You know, psychologists usually bring people into a laboratory. That's what's traditionally done. But I thought there, there's just no way you can possibly model all the real world usage of tech. What, what goes into it? You know, people have career trajectories and conflicts and stress and things that make them laugh. And the only way to really understand that is to study tech use in situ where people are. And so I create living laboratories where I use mixed methods, a lot of different sensors so that you know people can uh, be mobile and we can understand their tech use. So these are the results we found. This is with computer logging, tracking attention spans over the years. Uh, this is based on um, looking at how long particular screens stay in the forefront of, of uh, people's computing devices. Uh, and of course, we, we clean the data uh, very carefully. Back in 2004, this was actually before sensors, we, we were using stopwatches because we, we didn't have good logging techniques at the time and we would use stopwatches to time how often people were on any screen. And we found it to be roughly about two and a half minutes. And in later years, starting with 2012, we were able to use uh, computer logging techniques. And in the last um, five, six years, we find that people's average attention span on any screen averages about 47 seconds. Now, if we look at the median, the median is 40 seconds. And that means that half of all the observations we found are less than 40 seconds on any screen. And if we break this down into kinds of activity, we see email, people tend to spend a little bit longer on average. Productivity software means things like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, they spend a little bit longer. Communication software uh, would be things like uh, Slack, a little bit less. Uh, and of course, there's, there's a lot of other computer activity that isn't shown here. So you might be thinking, okay, what's so bad about switching attention if it's all within the same project, right? So if I'm writing a paper, I might have articles that I need, and then I switch to writing on a Word document. Maybe I switch to looking at data. So what's so bad about that? So we took the data and we clustered it into their respective prop, uh, projects. And this is what it looks like. So people will work on a project A, and of course within project A, lots of switching, okay? And then they'll switch and work on project B. This is a general pattern that we find over the day for our participants. And they switch to project C. And they start to work on project D, e, and then they go back and uh, go back to project A. Now, what's interesting about this is that when people are interrupted 
at the level of a project, think of it like zooming out to look at people's work activity. They don't, they're not just interrupted and go immediately back, but there's intervening things that people do. And if you think of this metaphor of the whiteboard, lots of erasing and rewriting on that whiteboard before people go back. And we find, in fact, that it takes an average of about 25 and a half minutes to go back to that original interrupted task. Uh, and people spend roughly close to 10 and a half minutes on any project before switching to, to a different one. Now, I argue it's just not possible to get into any kind of deep work when you're switching at the level of project close to every 10 and a half minutes. And if you wanna look at the data in a different way, uh, this is a, a different way to uh, present it. People change screens on average 566 times a day. Uh, they check email on average 77 times a day uh, and check Facebook 38 times a day. In the, this particular study, this was a, a company that did not use Slack. So if a company used Slack, that would be very interesting results uh, to look at. Now, I want to be clear. I don't want to say that all interruptions are terrible. And I want to be very clear that there are costs and benefits. So the costs you're probably familiar with, uh, it's a distraction from work. It breaks up our work. Uh, people have to switch contexts. Again, that, that whiteboard has to be erased and rewritten. Uh, it increases people's cognitive load because as you're switching, as you're doing new tasks, it's eating away at those very precious and limited cognitive resources that we have. And we know that interruptions are associated with higher stress. And this is work that I did um, uh, some time ago. And this was a laboratory study where we found that when people were in conditions where they were interrupted, their stress increased. So we were able to show a causal effect of interruptions on stress. But there's benefits too. And I, I don't want us to ignore the benefits. Uh, it enables people to take a mental break, uh, which can replenish our resources. Of course, if you interrupt something to do email, that's that's not, you're not replenishing. That's making the situation worse. And it, and it can be a social break, right? You can take an interruption to connect with other people. So that can have a benefit. Now, most people think that our interruptions are completely from things external to us. And everybody curses those notifications, those targeted ads, you know, based on algorithms. But it turns out that about half, 49%, of all interruptions are actually self-initiated. They come from within ourselves. Why? Well, there's lots of reasons. You might have an urge to look up information. You, um, you it could be out of habit. But I want to introduce you to a very famous person, very interesting person who has another explanation for why we self-interrupt. This person is Bluma Zygarnik, and she was a psychologist uh, in the 20th century, uh, really one of the first women uh, psychologists. And uh, she did a very interesting study. She had people come into her laboratory, and for half of them, they did tasks, and then she would interrupt them when they were doing the tasks. For the other subjects, they, they would do the tasks and do them through to completion. And at the end of the study, she would ask people to remember their tasks. And it turns out that when people were in the condition where the tasks were interrupted, 
people had a really hard time, uh, uh, sorry, when they were in the, the condition where the tasks were completed, people had a hard time remembering the tasks they did. When people were in the condition where the tasks were not completed, people remembered them pretty well. And Loomis Igarnik says that if a task is not completed, a state of tension remains in the mind. And the quasi need is unstilled. A quasi need is some kind of need that has to do with our intention to do something. We want to do something uh, as opposed to say a biological need, like a need to drink or eat. And she says that this, this quasi need creates tension in our minds. In other words, an uninterrupted, an, sorry, an interrupted task stays on the back burner of the mind because there is tension that we have to complete it. And so one of the reasons why we self-interrupt is because we have so many of these interrupted tasks that have been built up over the course of the day. And we have this nagging need that we should go back and finish answering that email or you know, answer that person who contacted me on Slack or finish this task. So we, we have all of these unfinished needs that have just built up in us. And of course, technology uh, provides us with the capability to do all of these different tasks and provides us with all of this information. So you can imagine uh, how it becomes a little bit chaotic in the mind. And this short attention, remember the median length of attention is 40 seconds. Um, I, I was searching for a word to describe it. It's very dynamic. Attention is jumping all over the place. If you're watching someone, you'll see people changing screens quite frequently. And uh, I thought kinetic was a very good way to describe it, right? Kinetic means dynamic. And so one of the characteristics of, of people when they use digital technologies is that their attention can become quite kinetic on a screen. This, this slide is a bit of a diversion. It's not really about attention directly, just indirectly, but I, I just found it so interesting. I, I wanted to share it with you. Um, this is the percent of people's days that they're sedentary when they're in the workplace. And one of the reasons I was very interested in this data is because people actually had done studies. So back in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, they had actually shadowed people also with taking notes and timing them to find out what percent of the day people were at their desks. And roughly it was, you know, 30, 35%. And if we fast forward to 2019, and this was a study done before the pandemic. It's a study that I did with colleagues where we used um, sensors and uh, beacons to detect location. And we tracked 750 people across the US for a year we found on average 90% of the time people spent at their desks. Uh, I've not seen data from during the pandemic, but perhaps it's equal to that, perhaps even more. But uh, you know why people are taking care of a lot more work at their desktops or doing more meetings, Zoom meetings, um, uh, email. So a lot of communication that had formerly been done face-to-face -face is now done at the desktop. There's both advantages and disadvantages in that. Now, many people think that there's two states of attention. This is the narrative that's used, that you're either focused or unfocused. And I want to present that it's a lot more nuanced than that. So, you know, when I think about attention, I realize that people can, you can be engaged in something and put in a lot of mental effort. 
Uh, if I'm trying to read tax law or, or if I'm trying to write a paper, I have to use a lot of mental effort. So I'm engaged in something, but I'm also challenged. But on the other hand, there's a lot of things that people do where they're very engaged in it and they're not at all challenged, like playing solitaire or playing an online game or you know, scrolling through social media, right? It's not really very challenging. And so I thought it was very important to think about attention in terms of these two dimensions, engagement and challenge. And so what we did was we probed people in a workplace throughout the day. And I, I realized we interrupted them and the irony doesn't escape me that we interrupted them. They had to ask very short questions. And the thing you were just doing, how engaged were you and how challenged were you? And we can put labels on these states. And these are just simply labels. If you're highly challenged and highly engaged, we call that being focused. If you're highly engaged and not really challenged, like solitaire, we call that rote activity. If you're not at all challenged and not engaged, we call that being bored. And if you're really challenged and not at all engaged, we call that a state of frustration. And here's what we found. Now, interestingly, only seven times did our participants claim they were frustrated. In other words, that they reported being challenged and not engaged. So I don't include that on the graph. But you can see that people have rhythms of when they're focused. They don't start the day ramped up in a state of focus, but they do other kinds of work and they slowly get into a, a state of peak focus in mid-morning, 10, 11 a.m. And then again in the afternoon, about 2 or 3 p.m. So we, we find that there are rhythms and it corresponds to the ebb and flow of our uh, theorized uh, attentional resources. Now, it turns out uh, we also investigated people's emotions with these different states of attention. And, you know, for many years, uh, research has shown that when people are engaged in something, they're happiest. Okay, and when, and when they're bored, they have negative emotions. It turns out that if we break down engagement into being challenged and not being challenged, people are actually happiest when they're doing this kind of rote, easy activity. They find it calming. It makes them happy. So uh, there's a lot going on when we use our digital devices. And I want to point out that we can't blame any single thing for our short attention spans. There's a lot of factors going on. And let me just run through some of them. Uh, so starting with the, the top left here, there are individual differences. There's differences in self-regulation ability. There's differences in personality traits like conscientiousness and neuroticism. Uh, if you happen to score high in a personality trait called neuroticism, your attention span will be shorter. Uh, I happen to score high in neuroticism, and that means you replay events in your mind over and over again. Oh my God, I could have said that differently. Uh, and because events are playing uh, in your mind, it uses up attentional resources and there's less resources to devote to what you're looking at. So your attention span is shorter. Uh, the lower left, there's all kinds of social dynamics. Uh, of course, we know this in real life, but these social dynamics also apply to our lives in the digital world. For example, we check email and Slack and social media because we exchange what's called social capital. And these are favors. You know, I'm gonna do a favor for you and check your email and respond to your email because I hope you'll do the same for me. There's lots of other social dynamics uh, wrapped up identity and even power and so on. 
Now, this middle image refers to the targeted algorithms that, of course, do play a role in our attention. Uh, these are algorithms that are based on using people's digital traces that they take, you know, we every time we go on the internet, we leave a lot of information. And this information is used and incorporated into algorithms that can be targeted to get at those things that people are most interested in based on personality, using keywords and ads and so on. The bottom right uh, illustrates how the very design of the internet uh, can distract us because the, the design of the internet where information is linked together by association, maps on and mimics the theory of how human memory is organized as a semantic network. Uh, I can say a whole lot more about that, but every time we go into the web, let's say you go on a Wikipedia page, there are so many entry points into our mind's network and you start reading something and it sets off just a firestorm of associations and you know before we know it we're we're joyriding through uh the web and uh getting stuck in a rabbit hole and the top right refers to a parallel trend that we've seen in film and tv over um the last few decades where shot lengths are now averaging four seconds i can't say cause and effect on our attention spans on our screens, but it's a parallel trend, right? And it's really a chicken and egg question. Um, and, and, and I should also say commercials are shortening in length. It's not uncommon to see six second commercials. If you watch music videos, those are those change at every two seconds. Anyways, you know, it film directors and editors could be influenced by what they believe people want to see they could be influenced by their own short attention spans. We don't know, it's a chicken and egg question, but we do see this parallel trend. Okay, so where does that get us, right? I don't want to paint a doomsday portrayal that, oh my gosh, we're stuck in this digital world and we're trapped, no, 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 no. I, I am very optimistic, and I believe that anyone can develop agency over their attention uh, to be able to manage the chaos in the digital world. So one of the first things to think about is that attention is goal-directed. Attention in the William James notion of attention, where it's controlled and we have a choice of where to direct it. In a study I did with uh, colleagues at Microsoft Research with Alex Williams, he developed a, a conversational software agent, which asked people to uh, talk about their goals for the day. And he found that when people could, talk, could um, articulate their goals for the day, they stayed on track uh, more than if they didn't. But just for a short period of time. And so what we learned from this is that it's important to keep reminding yourself of your goals throughout the day. And if you have to set short-term goals, that can be very helpful. The short-term goal of, I'm going to finish getting to the end of this section before I take a break. Now, I observe people uh, for my research and I would say I'm a professional observer of people. And I have learned to become a professional observer of myself. And I practice what I call meta-awareness. Meta-awareness means making the automatic activities you do, bringing them to a conscious awareness. When you can be conscious of them, you can act on that, right? And you can change and course correct your behavior. Now, uh, practicing meta-awareness means probing yourself. And I continually probe myself. When I have an urge to go to social media, I will ask myself, why do, why do I have that urge? Why do I feel I need to go now? Chances are because the thing I'm doing is boring or because I want to procrastinate 
because it's hard. I mean, there's a lot of reasons. And I asked myself, will I get value of going to social media? Chances are not. Uh, if I allow myself a break to say, go read the news, then I probe myself, am I still getting value? And if I'm not getting value anymore, time to get back to work. So it's a skill. Meta-awareness is a skill that can be developed. Anyone can develop it, and it just takes practice. Now, remember, we talked about uh, people have peaks and valleys in, in their attention over the day. You can find out when your own peaks and valleys are of attention. What is your own personal rhythm of attention? Uh, it depends to some extent on your chronotype. If you're an early type or a late type, uh, you can do an exercise. I've had my students do an exercise where they they write down uh, over the course of the day how how much energy, mental energy they feel they have. And that's a way they can identify their, their peaks and valleys. Um, design your day. Don't just schedule tasks back to back without breaks, but design it so that you're, you put your hardest tasks, the ones that require the most creative effort for those times when your attention is at its peak and you'll perform better. Uh, Yohaku no bi is a Japanese saying that means the, the beauty of empty space. And in any kind of artwork, painting, sculpture, or here in Japanese gardens, the space around the figures becomes extremely important because it, it frames the, these, the figures, in this case, the rocks. And when you design your day, it's really important to design empty space into the day. And that's, that's space when you're not working. It can be used for contemplation, for meditation, could even be used for rote activity, right? The simple uh, kinds of activity where you're engaged and you're not putting in effort uh, and we know it makes people happy and everyone has their own unique kind of rote activity, whatever works for you. Design empty space into your day. And of course, be strategic. So we don't, we can't do road activity the entire day. So you have to be strategic to be able to set a time on how long you do it. We also need collective solutions. Uh, organizations can um, put in quiet time for electronic communication. So here, window of time, when electronic communications can't be sent, sent, and this can serve as a way to reset this 77 times a day of checking email, right? So uh, it, it can make a difference. So it's, if any individual simply does a digital detox, it penalizes that individual, be, especially if you're a knowledge worker, cuts you off from important work communications, cuts you off from family and friends. So no individual can uh, do it on their own, but with uh, organizational help, they can. Uh, I'm a big fan of right to disconnect policy, the El Comrie law in France. There's policy in Ireland, in Ontario, in Canada. And it's the idea that people will not be penalized for not answering work communications after hours. It gives people a chance to detach from work, psychologically detach. It's really important, it helps people de-stress, um, helps them build up their uh, attentional resources for the next day. And people, uh, I think we need to design teams that include psychologists, not to make uh, uh, ads and notifications and information on the web more persuasive, but actually to design technology with the well-being of people in mind. And, you know, I've been the lone psychologist on design teams, and I, we sorely need that. And then, of course, we do need regulations for tech companies to basically control the kind of content, the way content is delivered. Uh, Francis Hagen uh, in the U.S., who used to work for Facebook, gave 
very compelling testimony about some of the harms that tech companies do. So we absolutely need regulations. So let's reframe our goal in using tech. Uh, instead of you know, thinking about it as chaos, uh, let's think about it for how we can use tech. You know, The ship has sailed, we can't get rid of tech, but let's learn to live with it and achieve a balance. And this balance is called psychological homeostasis. And it means experiencing well-being. So uh, thank you for your attention. If, um, if you want to learn more about it, as Tyler mentioned, uh, I uh, have a book which explains it and would love to hear you. Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> and uh, very happy to hear your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Um... That was a lot of information and relevant to kind of uh, pretty much everyone, I assume, that's here in our work and our personal lives. So uh, if anyone has questions, feel free to use the chat um, or raise your hand if you'd like to um, do live. Um, as you're pondering your questions and reflecting on some of these things, uh, I have a question, Gloria. I was, you know, I read a lot of random stuff on the internet when it comes to research. Um, one of them was AI and eye contact. I don't know if you've seen this too, but um, so like when we're on calls like this, like ostensibly it has other purposes to, um, you know, help us kind of like feel connected and everything. But um, I can very easily see be like, oh, good. Now I can multitask even more when we're on a call, and then you won't be able to see me. So I get credit for um, the connection. Oh. But um, it's just such a natural thing that I see it being used for. Who knows right now with some of these things? But I don't feel like they're necessarily getting to the, well, the the, the root of the problem, if that's what they're getting. No, I, I would even say it's encouraging the problem uh, because, you know, it, it, if, if, if I have ga a gaze on the camera and I'm doing my email, it's only going to encourage me to, you know, gives me an excuse to be able to do my email. So I, I think it's exacerbating the problem. We have uh, one question here for you, Gloria, so far. Have you researched teen use of technology? Team use? Uh, teen, sorry, like teenagers. Teens. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've researched college students. So I have not done teens. Mm -hmm. And I can say with college students, well, of course, mm -hmm. we know that they spend a bigger chunk of their day on social media, uh, multitasking with social media than uh, people beyond college age. Um, but their attention spans uh, are pretty similar. They're not unlike uh, people who are older. Uh, so um, yeah, so so multitasking does start young. I, I do know, you know, I've I've read the literature on younger people and multitasking. And, um, you know, actually kids as young as two years old, four years old are on screens um, for a couple of hours a day. Um, what's bad about putting very young children on screens is that there's a part of the mind called the executive function that is not fully mature. And the executive function, think of it as the governor of your mind, and it helps regulate us. It helps us make decisions of what we should look at. It helps us prioritize, helps filter out uh, information that's peripheral. And when that's not fully mature and you've got, you know, young children who are, you know, using the web and, you know, switching their attention, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not a good thing. So I, I think it's very important to restrict, um, at least children, young children from uh, from the web uh, as much as we can. You know, so it's okay if they're doing something supervised, like watching a film, uh, but, you know, we have to be very careful about exposing young children to the web. This just came up recently in a chat I was having with a colleague here in, the, in uh, Cambridge about um, uh, their, um, uh, uh, daughter is a, a teen and prefers everything in sped up mode, you know, so when it comes to watching videos or listening to things, so watching it at one and a half speed or, you know, two and a half speed, um, and then worrying about the implications of that for real life, because you can't experience real life 
get at least um, at two times speed. So it's kind of like impatience when it comes to like real human face-to-face -face interaction things. So um, yeah, that's one thing to think about, um, I guess. Uh, so, so there was a study done where they had um, children exposed to rapidly shifting videos. And then they had another condition where the children watched something that didn't switch very rapidly. And they found that the kids in the rapid video switching condition uh, actually uh, had worse, uh, it performed worse on cognitive tasks. So it actually did affect their um, their ability and it, and it could be due to the executive function. Uh, so this kind of, you know, rapid switching is, is not great. It's not great for kids or nor adults. And I appreciate uh, Obina's comment here, uh, listening to podcasts at 2.7 times speed. Um, oh, that stressed me out. That's too fast for me. Um, a couple questions here. So I'll take them in order. Oh, more questions. Uh, question from David. Uh, is there any gender difference in attention span? Good question. Yeah. So uh, there's there's not a gender difference in attention span, but there is in the ability to manage interruptions. And it turns out that, well, think for a second before I tell you the answer. Do you think women are better at managing interruptions, men are better, or there's no difference? Okay, so just think for a second. Tyler, what do you think? Tyler, think, do you have any? Am I on mute? Oh, sorry. Um, I would say yes. And I feel like emotions come into play, like especially social expectations and things. So yes, that women, men, or no difference. Who's better at managing interruptions? I feel like, so this is me... Um, kind of generalizing a little bit from some stuff that I've seen, but I feel like there's more of an expectation to respond um, for women in some cultures than men. Um, again, I'm speaking very generally here, but um, it's a little bit of that kind of like always on and, you know, not wanting to like seem rude or anything like that, but a mm -hmm. little well, bit. Well, yeah. So the the population we studied were knowledge workers. Turns out women are better at managing interruption in the following sense. they uh, When they are interrupted, they're faster to resume task than their male con counterparts, and they self-interrupt less. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm often asked, why, why do I think? Um, and people always, they always say, well, there's an evolutionary reason for it. Women were the um, gatherers and the hunter gatherers we we don't know that right we we don't know that for sure but i think it's more that um women have to feel that they have to perform above and beyond their male counterparts in a in a workplace and so they perhaps try harder to get back on on task uh and that's just from you know having interviewed people and people reporting that um you know, that's what they feel they need to do. A um, couple of questions. Uh, I'm going to try to keep up with everyone. Have you studied attention spans of people with attention deficit disorders versus the general population? Yeah. So, you know, we've given um, survey instruments that ask about conscientiousness. And there's also one, uh, the UPPS scale of impulsivity. And it turns out that, uh, so impulsivity is very highly correlated with ADHD. And in the population we've been studying, which are knowledge workers, we, we've we not seen uh, very many people at all that score in the extreme ranges of impulsivity. And so I can't, I, you know, I can't speak to the ADHD uh, population. The the best statistics I found is that in the U.S. there seems to be an incidence of roughly about four and a half percent in the adult population with ADHD. Uh, so so I can't I I can't speak to to that population. 
A um, few more questions in the chats. Anyone live or on camera that would like to raise their hand or have a question for Lori? It's okay if you don't. Um, just wanted to make sure everyone had a chance. Uh, yes, we do have a question. Uh, should I stop? Should I stop the share? So, um, yeah, I guess if everyone has the contact information. Yeah, Jonathan, you have your hand raised. Uh, yeah, feel free to chime in, please. Hi there. Um, thanks so much for the talk. Really fantastic. Um, my uh, so I, I put my question in the in the chat, but basically, in in a very early slide, you define tech. And I can't remember the words exactly, but or, or te technology is something that's purpose is to help us kind of do more. I think it was something like that. To extend our capabilities, yeah. Yeah, to extend our capabilities, and activity-based attention. Sorry, you cut off there. Can we you... missed the first part. Sorry. Okay, can you still hear me now? Yes. Yes. Great. Yeah. So, and a lot of your presentation was based around um, productivity focus, uh, kind of side of attention. And I was just curious what your thoughts or understanding was in relation to attention more in the mode of being, and particularly in an in a digital environment. Uh, by mode of being, you mean what? What do you mean exactly? So, I guess. Okay, say more. Uh, I guess productivity in my mind I associate with with doing and or, and so you know your definition of technology is like helping extend us to kind of do more I guess right and so I was just curious like what what is attention's role in 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 being as opposed to doing because particularly that like you were talking about well-being as well I feel like being is an important part of that of that spectrum it's not all doing yeah. Um, I, so yeah, I, I was just curious if you had any thoughts around that, and particularly like how to be in a digital environment, because that's yes. feels like almost impossible to me. <laughs> oh, it's a it's a wonderful question. I I love that question. So um, I talked about this idea of designing empty space into your day, and of course, technology kind of pushes us to want to cram as much as we can. And there's there's a popular narrative that we should try to be as focused as possible, as long as possible. And when people typically schedule their days, they tend to schedule tasks back to back without any break. We schedule Zoom calls back to back, one after the other, no transition between the calls. But the idea of empty space says, you know, let's let's think about the space between these tasks. And that space is you can use to replenish. And, th and that would be the, the being that you're talking about. And it could be used for ideally for contemplation. Uh, the, the best uh, use of it in my view is to go outside and take a walk in nature because we know that a walk in nature makes people less stressed. We also know that, and my own research shows that it, it increases what's called divergent thinking, which is thinking of more and different kinds of ideas. So there are so many ways that this kind of empty space can be utilized. And so that, that argues against this narrative of pushing ourselves to be as productive as possible, which means being as focused as long as possible. We have a question on the chat, um, Gloria. If you have a, a few minutes, um... I actually, I, I'm fine. I, okay. I res rescheduled my other meeting, so I'm fine. Okay, Javier, you have your hand raised. I was just about to read your question. Ah. So better yet, if you can do it live. Thank hello, you, hello, Javier. Thank you, Gloria. Pleasure to hear you speak, and so interesting. I, I yeah, you talk, yeah, again, it's super interesting, and very aligned with much of the work that we do, as you know. Um, I, I love to know what is your take on, I guess, this field of training focus, right? Like there are a lot of mobile apps that help you train and develop focus. And I, I was recently thinking of how much of it is hereditary, right? Like I mean, you might just born with the, the ability, intrinsic ability of being able to focus for long periods of time, right? So it, do you have any sense of that? And if it's something that we can train and develop, what would be some good strategies for that? Yeah. So people do have deferring abilities of self-regulation. That's that's for sure. In fact, 
you many of you are familiar with the marshmallow studies of Walter Michel. He, he actually was a professor of mine, so I'm a big fan of Walter Michel. But, um, you know, even at a very young age, the ability to self-regulate is evident. So there are differences. Um, now, these, these techniques to get people to increase their focus seem to have success, right? But uh, what I would like to know is what, what impact do they have on stress? right? Because we, we can't focus for extended periods without getting stressed because what I talked about earlier, the demands, when the demands on our resources exceed what's available, right? It, it stresses us, it gets us exhausted. And so there is this danger of encouraging people to focus for extended periods, and then we can get stressed. So it's very important to achieve a balance uh, and so, yes, for some people having, you know, if having these um, techniques might might work, there there's I think Adam Ghazali has done some studies with uh, video games where he shows that playing video games can extend focus. Uh, we also don't know how how lasting these results are, so they might be very short term results. You play this vid video game, you're all pumped up, you're, you know, you're, um, have a very high arousal, and then you can pay attention. And then we don't know, uh, can this effect last for weeks after, months after. So there's, there's a lot of open questions with that. Thanks so much. Any other questions as we start to wrap up from everyone? This will be recorded, um, or sorry, this is recorded, and we will post this online on our website and social media for anyone that wants to refer back to it later. Um, yes, question, uh, Dominica. Yeah, I guess I would like to say thank you more than ask a question because I am a digital well-being coach and I'm a huge fan of your yeah. work, Gloria. And there is not a single workshop during which I wouldn't mention your research. So thank no. you for that because I think it's it's super relevant what you're I'm, doing. I'm flattered. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Well, that's a very nice note to end on. So um, after Gloria's slide with the uh, amount of sitting we do during work hours, I have an acute need to stand up and move around. We'll probably <laughs> so, um, we should all get up from our screens and everything. But before we go, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Gloria, for joining us on this Monday. Um, appreciate your time and all of your insights and everything. And uh, next time we do an event, hopefully you can make it to our part of the world in person. Oh, I would love to. Yeah, would love to. Great. Okay. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Hope you have a nice uh, morning, afternoon, or evening. And uh, thank you again, Gloria, and looking forward to next time.